Welcome to the Rare Faith Podcast, where the solution to every problem is only an idea away, and where the same activity with just a little more awareness always yields better results. Award-winning, best-selling author, Leslie Householder, brings some of her best information to this inspiring series of life-changing episodes that you won't want to miss. Show notes for this episode can be found at ararekindoffaith.com. Hi, everyone. Well, I have three different timepieces up here, and they all say three different things. What have you got? I don't know which one is... 12.59, okay. And none of them say that, none. <laughs> Not even one of them. I have to remember my, uh, I am still set to Arizona time. But I know what straight up is supposed to look like. Are you from Thatcher? I am not from Thatcher. Oh, but I have a distant relative in Thatcher. Uh, is that Delbert's grandchild or son? So we're related, kind of, probably. You have to go back to 1729 or so to find the common ancestor that ties the Thatcher householders to us. But we did find it. And we hear about this family all the time and have never met him. We had a son who got on a plane to go on a mission for our church a few years back. And his brother had served a mission, so he already had a tag that said elder householder on it. And so this brother let him wear the tag on the plane, even though he technically would have received it when he arrived at the training center. And he gets on the plane, and just as we're checking in, because we were running late, the baggage people are like, oh, I think you already checked in, didn't you? We're like, no. Well, another elder householder just checked in. We're like, what? You know, because that's an unusual name. It turns out Delbert's grandson was headed to Italy, and they were on the same plane together. This is the first time our families had actually met after hearing about each other. I don't know if they've ever heard of us, but we keep hearing about them. And then that summer, I checked my son in at, another son in at a summer camp, and we were in the H line and met the sister. So that was fun. And that has nothing to do with my talk today. <laughs> but I divert easily. Welcome. My name is Leslie Householder, and this is the class called Keep Calm and Watch What Happens. I am a little curious to know if someone came here because of that title, not because you necessarily know anything about what I usually teach, but raise your hand if that title is what brought you in. Is anybody willing to share why that title meant something to them? Oh, your sister said you needed it. <laughs> Good job. Okay, back there. Your kids always tell you to calm down and what? It'll be okay. And it'll be okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you lived not calm in chaos before, and then you kind of let that go and chose to live more calm, and you've seen what's happened, and you're curious to see if that's like. A principle or what other people's experiences have been with it? What's the connection? Great. Okay, a scripture that says, Be still and know that I'm God. Mm, there is power. There is power in that. I am excited to teach this class. It's interesting because when I was when I was invited to speak at this event, I said, sure, actually, because some of you know that. I did speaking years ago and then had some life challenges and setbacks and I took a break and I needed to regroup and find my feet again and just recently I've been feeling like I think I'm ready to be back. And so when I was asked if I wanted to do this event, I'm like, actually, yes, I think I'm ready. And uh, she says, okay, great, what's the name of your class? And I'm like, oh yeah, I have to come up with something. I didn't want to do something I'd already done before because I like to teach new things as I'm learning new things. That's what keeps me interested. I can teach something that I've taught before, but I have greater passion and enjoy sharing much more if it's fresh for me too. And so when she asked, what's your class title? Literally, this is the first thing that popped into my head and it had never crossed my mind before 
keep calm and watch what happens. And I'm like, well, this is gonna be fun because what that usually means is for the next two months that I'm in preparing to be here, I get to experience some things and learn some things so that I've got something to share today. And so this was an experiment that I conducted for myself on what happens when I choose calm. And there was plenty of opportunity to test this between then and now, and it's been fascinating. It's been really, really fascinating. First of all, let me tell you this. I want to point you to my blog, rarefaith.org, and the reason is because if you just want to sit and listen today, but you write that website down and join my newsletter, then in the short term future, in the near future, I'm going to point you to everything that I'm sharing today. So you don't have to memorize everything you're hearing. You don't have to catch it all. You don't have to write it all. If you're on my newsletter, I will point you to everything I'm going to share. Okay? So you can just relax. You can just keep calm and watch what happens. What's that? Rarefaith.org. Right there. Yeah. Rarefaith.org. So, a little bit of backstory. I look back on my life and the way I have experienced it, to me, has been like living in a giant laboratory. I remember years and years ago, probably two decades ago, almost, when life was hard, things were going on, and I was just like, oh my gosh, what am I supposed to think about this? You know, another blow. What am I supposed to think about that? How am I supposed to think about this? And it just dawned on me later, I wonder what it was that caused me to even ask that question. Because somehow, deep inside, I believed that no matter what came my way, if I could learn to just think right about what just happened, everything was going to turn out okay. I don't know if that was an innate instinct thing to believe that, but I kind of believed it unconsciously until I started paying attention to my thoughts, and then I started to think about it more consciously. If I can just think right about what's happening to me, then I know everything's going to be okay. Isn't that kind of a comforting thought? That we have that much control over how things turn out in our life based on how we choose to think about what happens. And it was just a seed of an idea originally that has just grown and grown and grown, and it's actually rather huge. So... To begin with, my husband and I married 1991 and decided that I wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, wanted to raise a family. He wanted that for me. That was our an agreement that we made when we got married. This is how we want to be as a family. Awesome. We agreed, we got married, and then kind of jumped into it, not really doing the math on what it would take to live as responsible citizens. But we we operated on faith. We thought, if this is the right thing to do, then everything will work itself out. And it was the right thing to do, but everything didn't just automatically work itself out. Things got really hard. Things got hard so, there's a word, it's not incessantly, just something like that. Uh, Constantly, this constant struggle. It felt like a constant struggle to survive. And I just remember what comes to mind when I think about those years was there was a bank lady, the office manager at the nearby bank that we had an account with. Her name was Claudia. I can still remember Claudia. And how many times I would wake up to find out that we were overdrawn again and I would have to call Claudia and beg for mercy. And just that feeling like we did it again. We did it again. Dang it. And how am I going to explain it this time? For what possible reason could could she ever give me mercy this time when it's been so repeated? And so we'd overdraw or something would happen, a bill or a car would break down or a medical this or whatever. And it's like, uh, 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 like being in a boxing ring. And it got to where I would be full of anxiety about it. And if something would happen like that, I would uh, just, how how do you describe a breakdown, this fit of anxiety and thrashing and uh, and screaming and and just like a three-year-old not getting their way. This was me as an adult. Looking back, I can see I had no coping skills. 
to deal with the stress. I didn't know what to do with it, and I didn't know how to handle it. Fast forward seven years, it got bad enough that I'm just in this place where something bad would happen and it would set me off. I called the police on a kid who broke my broom. This was where my mentality was. So wound up, so tight, and so fearful and worried and stressed. And not seeing a way out, except that we would go to events that would teach us principles of positive thinking, business development, personal development. And I would get pumped up and excited like, oh my gosh, we can change. Things can be different. And I'd go home and we'd apply it, what we'd learned for a couple days, and then boom, another, another hit. And I'd be like, what the heck? You know, you bend metal back and forth enough and pretty soon it breaks. And I just felt like I was broken. So eventually we went to an event that had a speaker and I went reluctantly. I didn't want to be there. I was kind of tired of spending money on these things because we didn't have the groceries but we were spending it on knowledge because we felt like that was our way out. That was the way. And uh, at this event the speaker was not very exciting. It was kind of boring. First time I listened, I didn't even pay attention. But after it was over, everybody in the room was buzzing about what they had just learned. I'm like, oh no, I missed it. <laughs> what did I miss? They invited him back. I thought, this time I'm going to listen. I was on the edge of my seat, front row, ready with a pen. And receiving this information, my husband and I just looked at each other and I'm like, really, that's all it is? It's that simple? And the lights went on, we got it, and in three months tripled our income after seven years of hitting our heads against the wall just trying to make a change. And it's because the idea was so simple, but we had heard it so many times in so many ways that it, we were kind of numb to it. How many of you have heard Think Positive? How many of you have heard Dream Big? Yeah, 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 got that, right? You've heard that before, and that's kind of what I felt. Uh, but the way this presenter explained it was different. It kind of came in from a back door and hit me from behind. And I'm like, oh my word, I get it. I get it. And so, just so you know, that web page I showed you, rarefaith.org, if you go there and look for the visual aid that changed everything, I'll share with you what we learned from that speaker. It's an hour video that you can watch. It's free. So in all of this, I did learn that there is a right way to think in every situation. Many ways of thinking are good, but there is a right way that leads you to the best outcome every time. And so what I want this class to be about is give you enough stories and perspective to help you want to test the principle to stay calm and see what happens. To begin with, I want to share a quick story. This comes out of my book, Portal to Genius, which is the sequel to Jackrabbit Factor. And I need my glasses now. There was once a little acorn that wanted to become all that its blueprint promised it could be. It was meant to become a grand and mighty oak, but in that moment it was only a simple nut dangling by a stem. It hung on the parent tree and reached high, waiting to see the grand views and sweep the vast sky with broad branches. It wanted to experience the fluttering of leaves and the swaying of limbs, but alas, it could barely feel the breeze slowed by the shelter of its protecting parent. Finally, the parent heard its cry and said, Yes, little seed, I have great plans for you. You will scrape the sky and sway in the wind, and the view will be glorious. You'll provide a home for many creatures, giving shelter and food. Your friends will be many, your influence will be vast, and you'll be great and happy. The little acorn's heart swelled with excitement as it stretched its rigid shell upward to receive its promised reward, but instead of enjoying the exhilaration of greatness, it was shaken from the tree and took a long, hard fall, landing with nothing more than a slight thud. In fact, there was no apparent compassion or understanding since its terrible fall seemed to go unnoticed. Its very world seemed to have crashed down and yet time marched on for the world around it. The tiny acorn soon found itself trampled upon with dirt kicked rudely upon it. Eventually, it was completely buried in the dark and alone. Have you forgotten me, he cried, but there was no answer, no explanation and no reprieve. Instead of rescue, the rain began to pour, and at once the buried seed believed it just might drown as well. It tried to throw its weight one way and then the other to force its way out of the ground or to find its way back to the tree, but nothing changed. It was as though it was trapped and could not escape its doom. Weary of the fight, it surrendered to its fate, holding still with a sigh. The elements around it took notice of its calmed demeanor and began to respond to its mere presence there. 
In fact, without any more futile struggle, it noticed there was a subtle change taking place within itself. It discovered that as it remained calm, it already had all that it needed, right there in its immediate environment. It hadn't perished from being cut off from its parent as it feared it might. Though the fall was frightening and terrible, there it remained as alive and as well as before. No, it had not perished. Rather, it had sprouted new parts of itself from within that it didn't even know it could sprout, and the little seed began to experience the joy that always accompanies growth and soul expansion. Though it hadn't achieved its ultimate goal, it felt good enough just to grow. After its temporary period of loneliness and fear, soon the changed seedling broke through the crust of earth and could finally see the goal again, though it never appeared to be so far away as it was then. However, in truth, it had never been closer. Be patient, little seed. You were created for the greatness that is in store for you. Allow yourself time to develop roots and keep reaching for the sun. Have faith and success is inevitable. All you need to accomplish the goal will be yours in the right time. Remember, peace, be still. So when you feel desperate, I want you to remember the acorn. And then keep calm and watch what happens. What this means to me is remembering or thinking about the concept that our cells are made up of energy and our energy has an effect on our cells. And so whether we are trying to solve financial problems, relationship problems, or health problems, keeping calm is the way to be in the right energy for the cells to become more obedient. Obedient cells are well. Healthy cells are obedient cells. And they respond when we are calm. Now, when we feel worry, I want you to remember the thinking stuff. Let me tell you about the thinking stuff. This is from a book called The Science of Getting Rich by Wallace D. Waddles. It's about 150 years old, 100 years old. It is a classic. But he says this in chapter 4. Every appearance in the visible world tends to produce a corresponding form in the mind which observes it. And this can only be prevented by holding the thought of the truth. To look upon the appearance of disease will produce the form of disease in our mind and ultimately in our body as the cells begin to respond to those thoughts. Unless you hold the thought of truth, which is that there is no disease, it is only an appearance and the reality is health. To look upon the appearances of poverty will produce corresponding forms in our own mind unless we hold to the truth that there is no poverty, there is only abundance. To think health when surrounded by the appearances of disease or to think riches when in the midst of appearances of poverty requires power, but he who acquires this power becomes a mastermind. He can conquer fate. He can have what he wants. This power can only be acquired by getting hold of the basic fact which is behind all appearances, and that fact is that there is one thinking substance from which and by which all things are made. Then we must grasp the truth that every thought held in this substance becomes a form and that man can so impress his thoughts upon it as to cause them to take form and become visible things. When we realize this, we lose all doubt and fear, for we know that we can create what we want to create, we can get what we want to have, and we can become what we want to be. We must believe the three fundamental statements. I repeat them here. There is a thinking stuff from which all things are made and which in its original state permeates, penetrates, and fills the interspaces of the universe. A thought in this substance produces the thing that is imaged by the thought. Man can form things in his thought and by impressing his thought upon formless substance can cause the thing he thinks about to be created. I'm actually teaching a class on this book. If you join my newsletter, you will get more information about that class. It's a powerful, powerful concept that all things are made of this original thinking substance and that it responds to our thoughts. It responds to our thoughts. And so when we are caught up in fear, stress, worry, that is energy that is impressing upon the original substance that responds to that. I think back to all the years that I was 
angry and frustrated and stressed and anxious. And then more things would happen to me that would cause more stress, more anxiety, more problems. And it wasn't until I intercepted that cycle that things started to turn around. But when I did intercept it, things started to turn around very, very quickly. And it's become my message for the last 18 years. I get really bored easily. When I learn something new, I get bored with it easily. I want to move on and learn something else. But these principles have held my interest and my attention and my focus and my fascination for 18 years. Nothing has lasted that long. Well, there are things. But for the purpose of this conference, that has been huge for me. Oh, and I love this idea that nature is friendly to your plans. Like what you want wants you. You don't have to fight and struggle to develop that life of peace and serenity that you want to have in health, in relationships, in your finances. What you want wants you back. So let me go back to this. On the obedient cells concept, there was a, a man, a Frenchman, actually when he was a young boy, just before the Second World War. This comes from a book by M. Catherine Thomas called Light in the Wilderness, where she talks about this gentleman. Just before the Second World War in France, he was a, a happy child, but it was intercepted by an accident that left him permanently blind. And what he relates in his experience of becoming blind helps us understand how this works a little bit. He says, barely 10 days after the accident that blinded me, I made the basic discovery. I am still entranced by it. The only way I can describe that experience is in clear and direct words. I had completely lost the sight of my eyes. I could not see the light of the world anymore, yet the light was still there. All the world around me was convinced that I had lost it forever, but I found it again in another place. I found it in myself, and what a miracle, it was intact. I felt the light gushing forth every moment and brimming over. I felt how it wanted to spread out over the world. I had only to receive it. It was unavoidably there. It was all there. And I found again its movements and shades, that is, its colors, which I had loved so passionately a few weeks before. This was something entirely new, you understand, all the more so since it contradicted everything that those who have eyes believe. The source of light is not in the outer world. We believe that it is only because of a common delusion. The light dwells where life also dwells within ourselves. But he says this. He was able to perceive the light, and it changed with his inner emotional state. When he was sad or afraid, everything became indistinct. But when he was joyous and attentive, the light would return. Anger, remorse plunged everything into darkness. But a magnanimous resolution, a courageous decision, radiated a beam of light. He said, by and by, I learned to understand that love meant seeing and that hate was night. Sadness, hate, or fear not only darkened my universe, but also made it smaller. Outwardly, I could not avoid running against doors and furniture. I was punished very thoroughly and very quickly. And I love how he says this. Actually, the author says, his name was Lucerian. Lucerian? L-U-S-S-E-Y-R-A-N was his last name. Jacques, I believe, witnessed the power of negative emotions and energies in his soul. His inner light, which enabled him to see, even though he was physically blind, would seem to go dark when his mind indulged in negative feelings. For example, he found that when he was impatient, when he wanted everything to go faster, the objects in his environment would seem to change in their relationship to him, would seem to reflect his irritable negativity. And in his words, he said, all the objects immediately started to turn against me like fretful children. They changed their positions. I could no longer trust them. There was a glass which was on the table and which I had just seen a moment ago at the tip of my napkin. It disappeared a moment later. It was behind a bottle, and of course, in trying to reach for it, I turned over the bottle. Impatience moves objects in exactly the same way that sadness puts them in shadows, almost eclipses them, surrounds them by some sort of smoke or fog. And he says, on the other hand, that joy, which he learned he could intensify in himself at will, 
clarified everything. He said he could light himself. And that the degree of light in himself was based on his own decisions, what he chose to experience. And this power to choose, he learned, was independent of circumstances. What does this mean? What this means to me is that when we choose joy, when we choose calm, the elements around us respond. And I had, had an experience with this just a couple days ago. I was printing up some materials for this conference, and I kept hitting walls with their online print system, couldn't get anything to work, couldn't get them to process the card. It, everything was just not working. And it got me really worked up. I'm like, I don't have time for this. I ended up going into the print office, and I'm like, this is what's going on. I can't seem to get it to work. They told me to come in here. And she couldn't get it to work. She couldn't get it to work. And even in her system, it wasn't working. And I'm like, really? <sighs> Keep calm. <laughs> like, this is for the class. I know it is. All right, fine. So I take a deep breath. And, and oh, this was, this was one of the hard ones. Because when you're up against deadlines, it's really easy to get this way, right? So I'm tense. And I step back. And she could tell I was frustrated. She, the other customers around us, they knew I was frustrated and, and upset. And I step back, and I'm just like, <sighs> OK, just do it the way that you can do it. Because she had an alternate way that wasn't ideal. But I'm like, I'm going to let it go. I'm just going to let her do it this other way. And it was just going to have to be fine. <sighs> All right, fine. Go ahead and do it your way. Not five seconds later, she's like, oh, it just went through. All right, all right, I'm listening, I'm trying, I'm trying, <laughs> I'm trying. And I remind myself often, you know, every time I face those moments where you get to practice this, it's like starting all over again. You know, you, you think you've got muscle memory in that brain of yours to say, when you feel stress, go to calm. And the more you do it, the easier it does become. But it's a process. It's a process. But the promise is that if you do choose calm in that moment, things will go better. Because you are energetically having an effect on the systems around you and the elements around you. And you know, a person can think that's kind of out there or wild. I am sure that if, OK, I'm going to ask you, raise your hand if you believe this and if you've experienced it yourself. My hope is that after you are done with this class, that you will be motivated to test it intentionally like an experiment. The next time you feel something going wrong or something being a struggle to remember, keep calm. And not just keep calm, because we all know, calm down. You've got kids that are telling you, chill out, right? We all have that. But this time, keep calm and watch what happens. Start to trace the effect of your experiments. Start to trace it. So when you feel worry, remember the thinking stuff. It's all around us. It's permeating the interspaces of the universe. I have tested this on time crunches. And it has proven true even for time crunches. I think there are time warps. I really do. I will be late for a meeting. And it seems to be the same meeting. I'm always late for it. But I am late for this meeting. And I'm in traffic. And I'm, I'm tense. I'm like, hurry, oh, get out of my way. Oh, you know, red light. And I'm, and I'm tense. And then I remember, keep calm. Watch what happens. Now, there's, there's a part two to this. Because I know, I know we have all tried being calm. And things didn't necessarily go better. OK? There's part two to this. But in this being late thing, I want you to test it. What I do is, if I'm at a red light or something, I'll just take a deep breath. And I will imagine myself in the meeting, sitting there, feeling like, ah, I made it. I made it. And then I'll choose calm. And then I will go with the flow of traffic. And I will hold in my mind the image of me sitting there, feeling amazed and grateful that I made it. And literally, I have seen this add at least eight minutes to the clock. What, what was impossible. I mean, I live, I live probably 10 minutes away from this place where I go. And uh, 
I think I probably had four minutes to get there. I live 10 minutes away, I have four minutes to get there, and I kept hitting traffic. Mathematically impossible. And I did this, and I ended up with about three minutes to spare. It's kind of cool. Test it, test it. But it's two parts. It's not just keeping calm, but it's seeing yourself already there and being grateful and amazed. Wow, that was amazing. All right, so here's something that you can think. You know, remember at the beginning I said there's a right way to think. When you have a setback or a challenge or a blow or shocking news or something like that, it's important to pause instead of reacting. When we react, we immediately go into this stress or whatever, and we can recover from that, but it's way easier if you don't go there in the first place. Pause and just say this, that's interesting. Because saying that's interesting doesn't give it a positive or a negative assignment. It just is what it is. And that gives you a moment to take a deep breath and choose calm and then watch what happens. So I love this one. In the Mormon faith, there is a verse that says this. Ye endeavored to believe that ye should receive the blessing which was offered unto you, but behold, verily I say unto you, there were fears in your hearts, and this is the reason ye did not receive. I remember when I came upon this, I was like, whoa, that is kind of profound, kind of really profound, because I had been praying for something. I had been praying for help, been praying for relief, and it wasn't happening. And to read this does two things. Number one, it shows me that it might have been mine. It could have been. It truly could have been. But the limiting factor was my fear, that I had fear in my heart. Now, are we going to have fear? Yes, but what do we do with it? Do we chew on it, or do we kick it out and say, you know what, I choose to believe. That's another thing. I don't have it written down, but that is another mantra that I say is, I choose to believe. If in my heart I'm struggling to believe and I can't seem to find that faith, I will speak it. I choose to believe, and that is something. That is something. I believe the elements around us respond to that too, the declaration of our choice. So if we find ourselves missing a goal and we've had fear and stress about it, it's okay, start over, do it again, and this time, keep calm and watch what happens. How can you keep calm when there is impending disaster? Because sometimes there just is, and you know it. It could be a hurricane headed your way. It could be a fire behind your house. It could be a bill that is due at 5 p.m. and you have no idea where the money's gonna come from. The whole idea of this principle is to make sure that you are not the limiting factor in what can happen. Because miracles happen, amazing things do happen, but they happen where there is no fear. And sometimes we have to answer the question, well, what if? What if that does happen? What are we going to do? And it's your subconscious mind that's nagging you, that wants an answer. Because subconsciously, its job is to keep you safe. It's to keep you alive. It's to keep you breathing. It's to keep your heart beating all day long so you don't have to remember to do that. Thank heavens we didn't have to remember that, right? It just does that for us. But its job is to keep you alive. And if it sees or perceives impending doom, it thinks you might die. And it's going to be asking you all the time, what are you going to do if that happens? What are you going to do if that happens? And there is this policy that we have to ignore, 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 and always fight those thoughts of fear when no, it's going to keep nagging you until you give it an answer. Go ahead and answer the question, but answer it unemotionally, all right? If there is a fire and we've evacuated and we lose our house, this is what we'll do. We'll just, you, you come up with that plan, you decide ahead of time, and you answer the question, and it quiets your subconscious mind down so it will stop nagging you. And then holding that calm, keeping calm becomes a whole lot easier because you've already, you've already answered the other question. Well, am I creating it by answering that question? Not if you do it unemotionally. It's the emotion that communicates with the elements around us, the emotion. I want to share with you 
some ways that can help you see the end that you intend. Because number one, that is one of the most important things you do connected with keeping calm. You can stay calm while you're imagining the disaster. There, there's some mental gymnastics with that, but that's not going to help you. You have to replace the images in your mind that are disastrous, replace those images with something else. See the end that you intend. See yourself in that meeting saying, oh, I made it on time. I don't know how that happened, but I did it. See the end that you intend. And if it's about paying a bill, I wouldn't even necessarily see yourself paying the bill because that's not the point. The point of paying a bill is so that you can be living your life not worrying about bills. So see the end that you intend, which is how are you living your life now that the bills are paid? How are you seeing that? So see the end that you intend and keep calm and watch what happens. Let me share these. I've got a few little videos to help this is the first time I've tried embedding a video in a PowerPoint. We will see if it works. I hope so. Here we go. All right, those, those laws are described more completely in the book Hidden Treasures, which is a free download at hiddentreasuresbook.com. But the idea that as we think through these principles that law of polarity promises that contained in every adversity is the seed of equal or greater benefit. Okay, I can anchor my hope on that being true. And one by one, I can go through the laws and remind myself how to think. And by the end, I'm at peace again. And because I'm at peace, I am calm and I can watch what happens. It's really powerful. Here is an example of when we're really struggling because the images around us are stressful and urgent and impending disaster. It's hard to tell ourselves to be calm with all that in our mind. And sometimes we have to just wipe our slate, take a deep breath, and remember some of these things. Here's an example of, if you've seen the movie Bobby Fischer, Searching for Bobby Fischer, where he actually does this, and I love the way it's presented. I want you to remember from this little piece, don't move until you see it. Don't move until you see it. When you're feeling anxious, don't take action in that state of anxiety. We make mistakes when we do that. We cause more of the same problems to happen to us when we do that. But if we will keep calm, see the end that we intend, see it, and don't move until we see it, then watch what happens. I have seen tremendous power and effect come from choosing calm. And when we discover this power and we start to use it intentionally, it's like the greatest secret in the world. I mean, you just realize that nothing needs to touch you. Nothing needs to bury you. Nothing needs to overcome you or overwhelm you. That you have within you that power to stay master of your life and of your happiness. And imagine the world around you being friendly to your plans. Imagine the elements responding to your choice to be calm. Reflect on the miracles that you know of. Reflect on the miracles that you've already experienced. And just remember that 
anything is possible. Anything is possible. And we don't always get what we want, but if we choose calm, we can still have that serenity. And things go better than if we're not calm. And I look forward to hearing stories that you'll share with me. You can share them with me at my website. All of these videos and one other that I didn't have time to share with you are at, you can get to them from the rarefaith.org website. There's a lot of free things there and it's been a pleasure being with you today. I hope you will keep calm and watch what happens. Thank you. This concludes today's episode of the Rare Faith Podcast. You've been listening to Leslie Householder, author of The Jackrabbit Factor, Portal to Genius, and Hidden Treasures, Heaven's Astonishing Help with Your Money Matters. All three books can be downloaded free at a rarekindoffaith.com. So tell your friends and join Leslie again next time as she goes even deeper into the principles that will help you change your life.